Thank you, Dr. Lakawala. Very good presentation. Thank you for the questions. I apologize for the little technical difficulties. Um, also, I think I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. I apologize for that. My name is Norbert Barstevsky, and I have worked with Gene and the team for pretty much the better part of the last 23 years, setting up conferences and other environmental projects. I first met Gene in uh, 1998 at Florida State University. That's where we work together. And um, when I first came here, one of the first projects that we were uh, managing and working on was the Dean Apple remediation at Launch Complex 34 at the Kennedy Space Center. I learned a great deal about it, and I'm really looking forward to the next session by Michael Scalazzi, the founder and president of Innovative Environmental Technologies. And I think Michael will talk to us a little bit about the Dean Apple sites. Good afternoon, thank you. I like FIES, I've been doing this for about 30 years, but this is probably the first time I'd had FIES open for me. So that's, that's <laughs> uh, the title of my presentation is uh, a creosote story. Uh, and we're gonna talk about a, a chemistry called in situ geochemical stabilization. Uh, this is a, a technology that uh, IET, uh, a precursor of Fias's group, he was part of Adventus, uh, Keras, started playing with this chemistry probably early 2000s. Uh, it's been refined and applied in a variety of sites. I thought I'd uh, kind of give you a flavor for the types of sites it's been applied to. Uh, with regard to creosote, there's some other applications, certainly for uh, Dean Apple uh, applications. Uh, just as a, a brief background, if you take a look at where do you find creosotes, um, where is it important to us as environmental professionals, um, it's, it tends to be obviously a Dean Apple, it's heavier than water, and uh, you find it in uh, obviously telephone pole manufacturing facilities, uh, historical sites. Um, one of the sites we're gonna talk about uh, operated, uh, was probably one of the first uh, telephone pole uh, facilities here in, the, in Florida. A relatively large site, 90 acres. Um, you can also find it uh, in, in pretty ubiquitous uh, 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 locations. Uh, every uh, lumber yard uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, if you wanted a treated piece of two by four, had a pond of creosote in the backyard. And you wanted your two by four treated, that'd be one second, sir. I'll go out back, I'll dip it in it, and I'll put it in the back of your buggy. Uh, the other case study I'm going to present is such a site. It was a, a creosote pond in the back of a lumber yard in the uh, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, uh, you can also find it in shipyards. Uh, it was a waterproofing agent for wood vessels uh, up through the mid-1900s, but obviously in the 1800s. Uh, and, and it's a, a compound that sticks around if you've ever worked at a creosote site and you got it on your hands, you got it on your clothes, you, you smell it and it gets in your nose and you just smell it uh, for days. Um, talk a little bit about the, the components uh, uh, within creosote. These are probably, for the most part, uh, PAHs. Um, that's important when you start to take a look at what your objective is for the application of this technology entitled ISGS. Um, very often, the objectives of a uh, a solidification, this is a geochemical stabilization, very different than in situ uh, stabilization using Portland's. Uh, some, it's almost a little different than what uh, Fai has just presented. Uh, it's a chemical reaction that solidifies it, but we can also treat dissolved phase PAHs um, in, with this technology as well, and we'll talk about how that can be done. Uh, as in any site, uh, the remedy is just as good as the delineation and the investigation. Uh, just a little background, uh, I'm president of uh, Innovative Environmental Technologies. I started the company in 1997. Uh, we really uh, were one of the first companies in the country to do injection technologies. Uh, we currently have seven offices in the U.S., some internationally. Uh, we also have an environmental drilling division, a geotechnical drilling division. What we do is we work with environmental consultants, and uh, if you don't have a good delineation, then you don't have a good design remedy. And what Fayez and I do, and uh, any of the contractors out there that are in the audience, we rely upon boring logs, 
field analyticals, uh, annual reports, um, good Excel tables uh, without overwritten cells, um, PID readings on, on, on well logs, all those types of pieces of information can go to making a successful remediation. So when you start looking at Dean apples, especially if you have sand stringers, you know, the better your delineation, the better the remedy, and also the lower the cost. It's very easy to have, and I can't tell you how often we get an RFP that has two monitoring wells, a couple soil borings, and it's a five acre site. And we're asked to do a design based upon that limited uh, information. So what I would stress is if you're getting involved with a, uh, a Dean Apple or Creosote site, good delineation is gonna be key to uh, minimizing costs and maximizing efficacy. So what is ISGS? We're gonna talk a little bit about the chemistry. Um, and I talked about two sites. The Fanwood site is one of those little lumber yards and the uh, Cabot uh, Coppers uh, Superfund site in Gainesville is that large uh, telephone pole manufacturer. As the name insinuates, it's in situ geochemical stabilization. It's a NAPL stabilization technology. That doesn't mean it's just good for uh, creosotes, but we can use it in uh, manufactured gas facilities. We can also use it when we start to talk about the chemistry for l -napples. The way we have to apply it is a little different, and sometimes l are a whole lot easier to recover um, using different technologies. This is a technology that we have licensed exclusively worldwide from Peroxychem. Um, so we, we, uh, we work pretty closely together on, on sites, uh, sharing information and uh, IET working as the implementer. On the left-hand side, you'll see a sample prior to receiving this ISGS technology. We're gonna talk a little bit about what this technology is. Uh, my best analogy is this, everyone has taken that, that seventh grade chemistry class where you had a super saturated salt solution and somebody dropped one more crystal in it and suddenly the, the, the whole beaker went solid. Essentially that's what we're doing here, but we're using a permanganate based chemistry. And what we're allowing that permanganate chemistry to do is when, when it hits the napple, that organic, that initiates a reaction. So this, the permanganate could travel five, 10 feet, 15 feet from an injection location before it hits an apple. It could hit a soil with an apple entrained in it. And that'll initiate this ISGS reaction. And what it is, is we're gonna form a pseudo burzonite. So we're gonna, we're gonna add some additives to this permanganate. As it reverts to a manganese dioxide, we're gonna make some octahedral crystals, we're gonna make some hardening agents, and we're gonna get uh, this pseudo burzonite formation. So what we're really doing is two things. We are encapsulating that soil particle that had Dean Apple entrained in it that was fluxing into the, the groundwater. And we're also going to coat the Dean Apple with a M&M &M coating, if you want to call it, a purple M&M &M coating of uh, permanganate that's reverted to a manganese dioxide, so it's actually black. And at the same time, we're gonna plug up the pore volumes with all these crystals that are forming. So we're gonna change some of the hydraulic conductivities of the site so to inhibit that, any migration taking place. And lastly, and not, less, uh, not to be overlooked, is if we overfeed the permanganate within this formulation, we have residual permanganate, and permanganate treats dissolved phase PAHs. So if you have a, if you have a flux from your your creosotes or your MGP facility and is putting in these PAHs, we can encapsulate them, stop the flux, and then treat the dissolved phase with the excess permanganate. So in this one mixture uh, that kind of seeks out and finds these Dean apples, because the specific gravity is, depending upon the blend and the mix we use, ranges around 9.3 to 10.1 uh, pounds per gallon, so you're, you're, uh, you're gonna be of the same viscosities and specific gravities of the Dean apples you're looking for. So this is uh, an answer to the question that everybody's asking is how long does it last? How long if, if, I mean, we know if we put it in Portland, it's gonna be concrete and it's gonna last forever. How long does this, this permanganate base, manganese dioxide, octahedral crystal, pseudo burzonite, how long is that gonna last in situ before my client gets irritated with me? And the answer is, somewhere between 260 years and 2,500 years. 
So you wouldn't have to worry about your client calling you in any time near future. Uh, this is two core samples from two totally different sites. And obviously, you're, we're applying this into different types of geologies. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, this was a more liquid napple and um, kind of a flowable napple, and that's before and that's after. And when I say before and after, this is like less than 24 hours. This is a pretty rapid reaction. Um, th there's some residual permanganates that may be left over, but for the most part, you do that and you come back 24 hours later and that's what you see. Because that, that, that like that, that seventh grade science experiment, that crystal in that beaker happens pretty fast. That crystallization process takes place pretty quickly. So here's a little closer look. If you take a, uh, a sample and you, you put it in a, uh, in a um, an epoxy and you do some thin slice SEM, you could actually get a picture of uh, where the napples entrained within this pseudo burzonite and where you can see the soil grains and so forth. So this is uh, kind of the, the inside outlook of what's taking place uh, within the site. So you have a couple options. So obviously we just talked about soil mixing. Um, you can do permanent injection wells uh, or you can direct push injections. This technology will work on all types of those applications. You have to be a little careful with the soil mixing because once you form those crystals, if you, you, you torture them a little bit with mixing, you're, they're not gonna reform. Because remember, it, it went from the permanganate to a manganese dioxide, forms this pseudo burzonite. If you start stirring it all around, it's not like those crystals are gonna reform. Uh, certainly with uh, permanent injection wells, uh, with some considerations of, of how you construct them, and uh, direct push, uh, unsaturated and saturated. So here's this fanwood site. I'll give you a little background. It's, again, it was a, a, it was a lumber yard. It's in a little sleepy uh, bedroom community of New York City. Uh, there's a train station where everybody gets on the train and goes into Manhattan every day. And uh, this site was literally right across the street from the train tracks, and uh, it was owned by the city of Fanwood. Uh, and uh, so they had some quotes to excavate the site, haul the site, the soils away, bring in new soils and, uh, and compact them. The estimated cost for that to the city of Fanwood was $3.2 million. Uh, the consultant came to us, we came up with a design the end of the story, and now we'll get to the beginning in a minute, the end of the story is for $180,000, we solved the problem that would have been $3.2 million. The mayor of Fanwood won mayor of the year based upon the success of the, this, and, uh, and it also treated the dissolve phase. We'll show you some of that. So this is the area uh, where uh, this pond or ponds of creosote preexisted. Uh, you can see the, some of these GC fingerprints on uh, the, the, the dissolve phase of this. And the objective of this particular project, and it's always it's important to remember what your client's objectives are. Sometimes the objective is not to treat it to closure. Maybe they just want to reduce the napple collected in their wells. In this particular case, it was uh, the site needed to be closed so that they could build condos on it. Uh, so we arrived, and you can see uh, through this area, uh, the number of feet of product, and when we're talking product, this is free creosote. We had up to about five feet of creosote. Um, again, this is not an inexpensive neighborhood to live in. Uh, hauling soils contaminated with creosote really wasn't an option. They were going to have to put in um, sprung structures to contain the vapors. Um, they were going to have to cover the, the trucks. Um, there was going to be a big gaping hole right, right next to the railroad tracks. That was going to be an issue as well. Uh, so again, there's the, the cost variance. Monitoring well locations. And uh, so the pond itself existed kind of where you see this bottom right-hand side. And we uh, designed these injection locations based upon uh, the analytical provided to us by the client, the consultant in this case. And uh, we also built these uh, barriers, we'll call them, because there were, there were some low-level uh, creosotes, not, not free product, entrained in the soils. We didn't want any of any, any creosotes that would be generated or pushed from the injection moving off-site. You have to remember, whenever you do an injection, it's a poor displacement. So if you start doing injections and there's free product, 
you're going to push the free product somewhere. It's going to react with what you're putting in, but there's going to be some pore space displacement. Whether it's an oxidant, you're doing reductive technologies, whatever it is, you're going to do a pore displacement, and you have to design for that pore displacement. In this case, um, if there was any dissolved phase pushed, we didn't want to push it off site, so we put these reactive barriers in, again, using the uh, ISGS. So here you have the thickness of the product, and so we started, uh, baseline was uh, May 2012. Uh, the injections were performed uh, somewhere, somewhere early 2013, late 2012, I forget the exact date, uh, and the, uh, the results that were pretty instantaneous on the next sampling uh, in 2013 uh, for, uh, maybe mid 2013, because it was a little warm out now that I recall. And, uh, no detection of product. If you take a look at also, and this is really the uniqueness of this particular case study, we dose the ISGS formulation to excess. And we can talk about the different types of formulations, what the percentage of the permagnates are and what those all mean. Uh, generally, you have to do a treatability study. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can see what the results before and after were on the PAHs. And as a consequence, um, subsequent to this slide, the site re received clean closure. They've built million dollar condos on it since then. Here you can take a look at what these creosotes look like when they, at this particular site, again, this is 24 hours later, what that creosote looked like in a core sample. So it, it really, in this particular case, it was an old aged creosote, again, from an old lumber yard. Huh, that doesn't belong there. Okay, and there's after. I guess maybe that makes sense. And there's uh, the site afterwards. You can see the nice condos above and retail space. So there that was uh, the small side. Now we'll, we can go to the, the Gainesville facility. Again, this is a rather large facility. And uh, this has been a project that uh, I think Fayez and I have both been involved in since 2003. 1999. So there. So. Th so there's all kinds of great stories we could both tell. I mean, we've been both on this site decades now that we talk and say it out loud. And uh, so this is just some of the implementations of our guys on site. Um, if you take a look at uh, key to the success was, uh, in this case, uh, Tetratrack did an outstanding uh, job on delineating this in three dimensions. We knew where the creosote was. We had targeted intervals. Uh, we had different identified areas. And so we approached this uh, with the client from a, uh, all right, let's do a pilot in one area. Let's do a pilot in another area. That's 2008, I guess, is when we, the first pilot I think we did was in 2005. But I think we really started going in 2008 with pilots. Um, and then we did certain sections every year. So, you know, at the end of the day, maybe it was a million dollars a year for every couple of years for the client. And uh, each area had different delineations. And we've had to come in and do a little bit of polishing in, 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 in certain areas. There had to be a, a thousand temporary points put in this site for monitoring uh, Dean Apple. Um, but this is kind of the, the design, and this is kind of be a little hard to see. If anybody wants a copy of this presentation, I'll make it uh, available to you. But this is some of the 3D uh, renderings that were provided to us from TetraTech. We worked with TetraTech on the design and the dosings. So if you take a look at uh, uh, this one particular application, this is in the, uh, the process area. Uh, there were 1,500 discrete injection events at 267 uh, injection locations. But at that particular uh, mobilization, we did about 187,000 gallons of the reagent. And uh, if you look at uh, before and after, and again, this is from January 2015 before. Uh, we were there during the summer of 2016, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, the summer of 2015. And by early 2016, this is what the NAPL looked like. So all, those, all that yellow is different levels of NAPL. Uh, within a year, there are these isolated pockets in Apple. Some of that may have to do also with just, again, we were talking about that poor displacement issue. Um, again, literally a thousand wells on this site. Uh, but if you take a look at the producing wells versus what they were producing prior to and then following the ISGS treatment, you can see the success of the particular process. And again, going back to my earlier statement, 
this particular objective for this site was to make the DNAPL go away. We didn't monitor dissolved phase. There's, not, and there's no dissolved phase. In fact, the client didn't want to know what the dissolved phase when this, nobody asked them, so uh, no harm, no foul. And uh, our objective was DNAPL recovery, and that's what we accomplished. So we see uh, uh, these temporary points, uh, reduction within the first year of 83%. As, as a side note, uh, we're actually going to be on site abandoning these tips the week after Thanksgiving, and we're just putting permanganate down the tip points before we abandon them, just for good measure. Um, to, if we catch any napple that's in train, maybe in some of the, the, the sand packs. So you can see before and after, and this is biweekly recovery in gallons. Um, so it went from collecting. 20 gallons, we'll call it 10, 10 gallons a week at this particular location. This is a single location, one well, 10 gallons a week to uh, practically non-detect. So again, uh, the uh, solidification, ISS estimated cost, $10.5 million uh, at the end of the day with all, of, all the associated costs, uh, 2.5 million. With that, and I have four seconds left, I'll have to take questions. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jane Williams with Aptum. I have a question about, you mentioned that you're going to put condos on top of the material that you created. Was there any compaction or structural testing that you needed to do before you proceeded with the condos? Uh, to answer your question, yes, um, and, and with the, again, looking at what we're doing here is we actually are creating a geological formation where, where none existed before. So we're, we actually increase the compaction uh, characteristics of the soil significantly. It, it, not a large amount of this material was injected, but we're forming burzonite, so yes. Any more questions? I should have included more slides. <laughs> I 